Hey friends, welcome to the channel. This is Maggie. Welcome to Nurse Training and Advocacy. I created this channel because I wanted to focus on educating nurses, mostly in long-term care, so I could pass on the tips and skills that have made me a pretty good supervisor. And I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, to pat myself on the back or anything, but I've heard it from different people that I was good at that particular job. I'm good at other things too. But I am so worried about the exodus and the burnout and the mental health crisis that I see my fellow nurses experiencing. And knowing from a business standpoint that there are so many things that we have no control over. I felt that I wanted to create a space where nurses feel safe coming and talking about the things that stresses them. Because a lot of times people are going into crisis. The biggest issue is because they can't be heard. There is no one they can unload all those emotions and the stressors where they feel that they can cry their eyes out and they feel alone. And I want to tell you, you're not alone. I work in mental health and I deal mostly with adults, but I think I can create a space for you to come in and, and talk and relax and let your hair down and be yourself. So nurse advocacy and training. This is the name of the channel. I am planning on having some weekly lives pretty much on, um, hmm, let's see, probably on Facebook because that is where it's not open to everyone. So whoever is a member will be able, able to join and I would have to give you access. So that way we can control who comes in and that we are just a family. So I am planning on, I'm still working on doing my free webinar and I'm not going to give you the title yet. I'm still working on it because there's just so much going on that I'm having a little bit of a challenge narrowing down so it's not overwhelming. And I have to find what is the problem that I'm trying to solve. And right now it's just the hysteria, the burnout, the, the exodus. And because we know at the end of the day, it's going to affect patient care. And I know the majority of us care about those patients. That's why we're so stressed. That's why we, we feel so guilty. That's why even the nurses who have quit, they have to deal with the guilt. They question themselves. And then, you know, it's just an added layer of stress that you put on yourself. So I am planning on doing a couple of presentations a week. It could be two videos. It could be one video and one post. So be on the lookout for that. So today, and again, I'm going to try not to be, <laughs> I say that all the time, not to be long-winded because, you know, I know our attention span is not really long these days, but I'm trying to understand because we all know agency nurses coming in, they're making oodles of money where we who are still working the floors and providing the direct, direct patient care, we're not getting that money. Uh, in terms of maybe retention bonuses or um, improve, you know, patient environment. And let me tell you, I am listening to a lot of podcasts and I'm reading a lot to get a grip. And you might want to know that this is not only affecting the U.S. This crisis is worldwide, okay? You have, I was listening to a nurse in Canada. They're calling code orange on you know, at some of those hospitals, meaning we don't have nurses. You can see empty beds, but we can't put patients in those beds because we don't have nurses to take care of them. Uh, I heard a CNO talk about there aren't enough applicants coming in. Now, people would argue that there are plenty of nurses. We're just coming to the point where we're like, we're not working under these conditions anymore. And that's a whole different conversation. And I think that's part of the advocacy that we want to do. I think as nurses, we've been playing nice too long. People have been stepping over us. 
they just keep throwing everything at us and we just take it all in and say, oh yeah, we Florence Nightingale with our little cap and gown and we can do it all. Well, we can't, right? Baby boomers such as myself, we will roll over and take it all in. But the newer generation of nurses, mm -mm, they're not taking it in. I've heard of nurses who have been in the profession for two months, three months. It used to be a year that they leave. Not anymore. They're like, you can take this job. I am out of here. So we have got to adapt. And I am grateful for the new um, pool of nurses who are saying, I need quality of life. I need time to be with my kids. My family comes first. I'm not going to work under these conditions. And maybe, just maybe, the powers to be, the guys who control the purse, the ones who have the money, maybe unwillingly somebody can pry their hands and get the money to do the things that they need to do. And there is so much that they can do to make this situation less dire than what it is now. It takes will, okay? Intention. Those are two words that are going to guide my path this year. Two words, intention and will, okay? So what I did in trying to understand why is it that you would bring an agency nurse and pay her three, four times what you paying your regular nurse. I was in administration. I was a business owner. I know it costs you an additional 33, 40% when you, you know, in terms of benefits for a nurse. So to tell me if you give a CNA $1 an hour more, it's going to break the bank. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I'm not buying it. So what I did, I called one of my friends who is a seasoned DON, and I need to talk to an ED as well, an administrator, because I need to get an understanding as to how do you justify doing what you're doing, having all these travelers come in, when you see your nurses just exiting, and you're like, huh, no biggie, let me call this agency. I used to own a staffing agency. I know they're making so many millionaires right now. They're making a lot of money. We nurses are not doing what we do for the money. There aren't many nurse millionaires who are at the bedside, okay? So we have got to protect what we can. We have no control. We hope, we would pray for some legislative relief, but I'm not holding my breath. The actual political climate that we have in this country right now, I'm not hopeful whatsoever that anything is going to be done at that level. So what we can do is work at the local level. You know, you have to know, you got to pick your battles, right? Okay. So I talked to her and I said, help me understand what your, because I know what nurses do. I know the complexity from an ICU nurse who I just watched while I was driving was almost in tears talking about what's happening in her institution and uh, the pull, you know, the guilt and pull that she has about making decisions that are going to be good for her family. It's really heartbreaking. But in long-term care, I needed to understand why we are at this level of situation that we are in where nurses are overworked, we have COVID, and then this disconnect that there is that the staff feel that management doesn't care. I've experienced management like that who doesn't ever even acknowledge that you exist. Now, I'm going to be training supervisors and maybe some DON, but you know, some people are in these positions who have no business being directors of nursing, who have no business managing people and leading people. They just don't have the skills. That's why I, I'm going to tell you that you need to take that assessment and see, do I have what it takes? And if you're willing to be trained, there is hope for you. But if you come in there saying, well, I've been doing this for 20, 30 years. I know what I'm doing. And then your attitude stinks. I'm sorry. That is not attractive to me. And I'm not going to say, oh my gosh, she's so good. She's so experienced. Experience alone doesn't make you a good manager. Okay. Get this to your head. It's very important that you understand that. So I asked my friend, so she's been a nurse uh, in a DON, not a nurse, 
DON for about 30 years. So she's seen these, uh, the, the industry, you know, ebb and flow and move. And the changes that she has noticed have not been for the better. Because we all know that most of these nursing homes, that's why you have a lot of consolidation from the 80s on, starting all the way to the 90s, 2000. People just keep buying, buying, and having like three, 400 of these buildings all together. And what the goal is to squeeze as much profit as they can out of those buildings. Now, the people who make those decisions, they're like in the corporate offices, you know, with the big glass windows and you know they uh they go to lunch and you know they they go to happy hour they just kind of crunch the numbers and they come to the facility and they say okay this is your budget we expect at the end of the 12 months that you're going to show a 35 percent profit now this administrator has her his or her marching orders his job or her job is to make sure that at the end of that year that fiscal year she or he is showing that profit whatever it takes, okay? Whether it means cutting staff, whether it means cutting supplies, whether it means not make, doing the repairs to the building, that's how they get it done, okay? So I was asking her what are the specific duties of a director of nursing in addition to being responsible for patient care, quality, they are um, judged or evaluated based on the number of complaints patient satisfactions, um, and survey results. You know, if they get tags or if they get an IJ, which is a really big, bad uh, tag that you can get from the surveyor when they come. All right, so in addition to that, she said also they're responsible for central supply, they're responsible for, um, also, another thing that they get evaluated on is return to hospital. So that's why <laughs> you guys know a lot of time patients are in dire, you know, situations and they're like, no, 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 don't call 911. Let's see what we can do. We'll put a pick line. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And within reason, I'm all for it. But you have to know when you can, you're in over your head when the level of care the patient needs is way beyond what you can provide, especially if you have a bunch of inexperienced staff, which is what we have right now, okay? Um, also, I ask, do you have control over staffing, like clinical staff? They're not responsible for, for rehab. Rehab is a contracted service, so the DON doesn't have control over that, okay? So she can say, well, you know, I need a three to 11 nurse, I need 11 to seven, I need three CNAs. She knows where the holes are and she'll work with HR to get people in. She does the interviews, but in terms of how much she can offer that applicant, it's all determined by corporate and she cannot go out of that range. So you can't say, well, let me throw an extra dollar here and there. <laughs> okay, they put the cuffs on you. You cannot do that. Uh, I think it's the same thing about offering bonuses. Bonuses, I would think, would be determined by the administrator. Okay, the DON does not have control over the money. Understand that. So if you have a DON who's working with you and you're upset, don't take it out on him or her. That's not part of her job description. That's not part of her responsibility. Okay, so I ask her because you know they're still they're all dealing with the same issue in terms of not having enough CNAs. Another thing, like a little observation, in listening to some uh, executive nursing manager, CEO, CEO, COO, one of the things that uh, they said is that if we can provide services to support nurses, because Right now, the problem is not just nurses. My daughter just graduated as a physical therapist. She's already burning out. So I'm having to coach her into saying, you need to take time for yourself. You need to take your time off. When they ask you to work extra, if you did it one time, you say, no, I can't do another one this week. No, I'm sorry, I can't. You have got to be strong and say no. Now what they did, and I remember this 
I remember this. Like in the 80s, they started adding stuff to the nurse's plate, okay? In addition to doing the care of the patient, they come up with this complicated documentation. You know, on the computer, you have this long assessment. Whereas, you remember the days, if you're like older, as old as I am, where we used to write a note, five, six sentences for the, for the, for the shift, that told everybody how did person do for that shift. Oh no, they came up with these long forms uh, and they tell you, oh, you're charting by exception as if that was gonna make, take you less time. No, we got, we, you know, we got bamboozled with that and we just roll over and it's like, and in the name of progress, in the name of improved quality, they just dumped it on us and we took it. How many times you're in on your unit and there is no unit clerk? Oh, if you work in long-term care, there is no secretary. So you're the nurse, you have your 15 patients, you have an admission, you're the one that has to go in there, put that patient in, put the meds in, do this, do this, do that. That is totally unfair, that is bull. So we turn over and we accepted it. One more thing. Um, if patient needs something, some supplies, instead of having somebody responsible for that, we have to go in there and hunt for that piece of whatever we need, dressing or whatever. Half the time, they don't have it. So you have to go to another unit. You got to rummage through somebody else's, find the key. Those are time wasters. Okay, so there is so many things that they have added to us. One thing that came to mind when I was thinking that this nurse CNO said they started to, uh, what's the word she used, to populate certain things. Because, you know, in the hospital, they, um, so in, somebody's calling me and I'm trying to de uh, decline it. Sorry. So somebody, um, okay, now she makes me <laughs> forget what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, they populate certain things. So once you enter an information, a piece of information, once, it should populate through the system in long-term care. How many times do you have to document blood pressures and vital signs? Some facilities say, oh, no, the CNAs can do that. The nurse has to do it, dumping 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 now pcc there should be a way for pcc that once somebody enters the vital signs it should populate i should not have to enter a blood pressure every time i give a blood pressure pill my god in 2020 in the age of technology that shouldn't happen those are intended to frustrate a nurse and if you value a nurse you will find a way to eliminate this waste of time, okay? Uh, I asked my friend, I said, do you think this problem was brought on by COVID? And of course, we all agree it, no, it didn't happen because of COVID. COVID just exacerbated it. We've had nursing shortages before in the 80s, 90s. In fact, my whole career, I've heard about the nursing shortage. What is different now is that you have a pandemic because just because I'm a nurse doesn't mean I'm not concerned about COVID, right? I had COVID. I caught COVID myself. So you have someone who is worried about her safety, his safety, but yet knowing that I have to go. It's like going into a war zone knowing that you could get killed. And that's why a lot of them are, are diagnosed with PTSD. That's what it means. I have to do my job, but I know I'm putting my life at risk. And we nurses do this every day. Even before, we used to do it, you know, when AIDS came on, um, hepatitis and all that. But this level of mental uh, concern and stress. And let me tell you, if you're in long-term care, you need to go to an ICU and watch a patient who is not doing well, a COVID patient, and see what's happening in that room the number of poles and pieces of equipment. Sometimes they're on dialysis, they're on the vent, they're on like multiple pressors, they're getting a blood. I mean, it's insane, okay? 
and you all seen this thing about in 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 social on social media about only a nurse can figure out this stuff no doctor nobody else can do it so when you have an acute patient and then you tell a highly trained icu nurse that oh in addition to having this one you're going to have two more and that's when that nurse will lose it because she knows that if she's not astute and if she just kind of gets distracted and maybe pushes one number wrong, this patient could die on her watch. All right. And, you know, somebody said, well, let a politician uh, shadow you for a shift. Maybe they'll get it. I don't have any hope that they would. The politicians that we have today in this country, they don't care about you. So don't waste your time asking them to come and shadow you. They've already made up their mind. They're all sticking together. They want to keep the money together. That's why legislation cannot happen because in Tennessee, where they're going to, to put out there how much money the CEOs are making, all of a sudden, that bill got killed. They don't want you to know. We know. I used to be on the board of a hospital. I know how much the CEOs make. It would make your head roll. Okay, so as you're fighting to get your CNA to get $12 an hour and you can't, they're making the million. They do not care what's happening. For COVID, they got a bunch of money, but it's still not enough. It's never enough. Ugh, that is a problem. So yes, we do not, we cannot blame COVID for what is happening. We should have expected it. I knew from the very beginning, I said, we're going to have a lot of nurses with PTSDs. I am grateful that I haven't heard of really lethal decisions being, being taken. Like this young, beautiful 30 year old who just, you know, what's the word I'm, I'm, I'm looking for? She just jumped from a ninth story. You know, I mean, you have to be totally hopeless to make such a decision. And I don't want anybody to get to that point. So that's why I invite you. When I do the lives, please come in. I mean, if I can't sit face to face to talk to you, when I open, you know, the, um, the chat, please, let's talk. Let's talk. Because it's not worth it for you to lose your life or your mental health for a job. I keep telling you guys, we are disposable. <laughs> if you were to die now, maybe they would send some flowers and then they're going to go next. So learning to be assertive and advocate for yourself. Only you can do that. No one else will do it for you. So let's not blame COVID. So COVID, the acuity of the patients is worse. The whole fear of catching COVID is adding another layer. And you guys know in the beginning, we didn't have any protection. We were be being sent. It was like sending you to war with not a gun. Okay? My facility used to ask me to take the used mask that the staff was using just putting in little brown bags they'll say spray it with lysol that's what we were doing and we wonder why people are dying okay also it was mentioned to me that these people up there in their glass building their glass windows they use psychology <laughs> to get us to do what they want so now it's like heroes work here heroes my foot Okay, heroes work here. Is that supposed to make you feel better? That they're overworking you? Asking you to do three doubles in a row? No. All right, the, the last thing that I wanna say, and I'm like, yes, we are concerned about patient safety. We are nurturers by default. Those of us who enter this profession, we care about people and we know what we need to do to keep our patients safe. So when we are put in situations where we feel like we're not doing our best, we're not giving our best, it is frustrating. This nurse said, a change of shift, she got report, and then when she saw her assignment, she had a full-blown panic attack. You don't just start having a panic attack right now. No, that's been building up. The anxiety built up and built and built until it exploded where you cannot function. 
okay? So we don't want our nurses to go through that. If a nurse had a panic attack, but yet she can't go home, she has to stay, finish her shift. Do you think she was worried that maybe in her state, she might give the wrong medication? Maybe in her state, she might miss something? Think about anxiety, 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 anxiety. Don't let that happen to you. So we're like, what is it going to take? As I said, I am not hopeful that there's gonna be legislative intention or decisions taken to correct that problem. California has a ratio, staffing ratio law, right? But everybody points the finger at, at California as being this wretched place where you got a bunch of loose people. Anyway, let's not get into politics, okay? So I don't have any hope that that's gonna happen on a national level. I don't think so. Not in my lifetime, okay? Because people are just so, they don't care. They really don't care. Maybe if a few mothers and fathers of politicians were to be affected by it, maybe. But if it's like the average Joe, they don't care about that. They really don't. Okay? So, again, my question, I went back to my question. How can this continue to happen? And it was like a light bulb went off. Meaning the way the tax system is structured. And that's why people get away with so much. And they say, oh, I'm smart. I know how to um, write things off. That's why the billionaire and millionaire don't have to pay taxes. And we paying 30% of our little wages to IRS. Okay. It's because once they can justify by the numbers that they don't have enough staff to safely take care of patients and they have to go outside and get agency or a traveler. Their uh, CPAs say, oh, ding, ding, ding. Yeah, you can hire them. We're just going to lump all that money and write it off as expenses. You know, you can write it off and you get tax breaks and benefit to show that you were really in a bind and you had to go to that extreme to make sure your patients were safe. Were safe. Really? So write-offs, that's how they're able to do all that. So a lot of them are saying, oh, it's killing us, but yet they're still doing it. You have hospital offering $30,000 sign-on bonuses to people who have one year of experience. Yeah, after you have your heart attack, you want that nurse with one year of experience to take care of you. When your grandpa had that, uh, that uh, kidney transplant, yeah, you want a nurse who just graduated six months ago to go in there and take care of you. Is that what you want? No. So I just wanted you to understand that the staffing crisis, there's a lot that we cannot control. The guys who have the money don't care what's happening at the local level. They just want their 30% net profit, come high or it doesn't matter. They're going to get it. And um, there is something we call creative accounting, which is the write-off thing, okay? There are all kind of shenanigans they can play. But at the end of the day, the person at the bedside is the person who's going to pay the price. And we, as healthcare providers, should not become commodities. It is time we put our foot down. I am distressed about the exodus of nurses, but at the same time, I'm encouraged that people are being bold and they're being brave enough to say, oh, hell no, I am not working under those conditions. So we're just hoping that somehow they're going to get the message that things need to change. The work environment needs to change. But in the meantime, I want you to come be with me. Let's have a kumbaya moment where you feel safe and you can be heard and you can regenerate. And I think my first class, my first free webinar is going to be about how do you protect yourself from the burnout 
so that maybe you won't have to quit altogether. Maybe you'll take a sabbatical. Maybe you'll step away from it for a while. And I think most of us have at one point or another. So guys, this is for today. I get really excited and passionate when I talk about this topic because I just can see it. You know, you don't live to be my age. Do not realize how business is done in this capitalistic society. And, you know, I don't think we can take on the big guys. We just have to do what we can at the local level, at the intimate level, one for another. Let's do what we can. Let's attack what we can. Let's not, the serenity prayer should be the prayer you say every day. Give you the courage to change the things you can. Um, I forgot again, how realize what you can't and wisdom to know the difference. Okay. You can't fight the big guys. Let's see what we can do at the local level. I hope you have a beautiful day. I hope these words resonate with you. My goal is to educate you, to make you think and to become self-reliant and love yourself more. Because let me tell you, if you get caught in that, you know, a capitalistic view of life, you're going to kill yourself. And once you're gone, you're gone. They're going to forget you. So protect yourself. Take care of yourself. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.